of the great famous sages in the Hasidic movement was Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev. He was not born into a Hasidic environment, but became a follower of Hasidism and later a leader of the Hasidic movement through his contact with various individuals, leaders, teachers. First time he heard about the Hasidic movement was when he was a young man, married, short time, and living with his father-in-law, parents-in-law, and continuing his studies. And as he had heard of this new movement, he approached his father-in-law, who supported him at the time, asking him for permission to take off for a while, some five, six months, to go and travel to Mizrich, the seat of the leader of the Hasidic movement, Rabbi Dov Beer, the great Magid. His father-in-law laughed. He says, what do you need from those crazies, from this new movement, from those new people? Whatever you want to learn, whatever you want to study, there are plenty of resources to be found right here in town. But he persisted and he nagged until his father-in-law finally relented. And he says, OK, since Mesrich was about five, 600 miles away from where he lived, and in those days, no cars, no trains. This goes back to 18th century. So he told him, you have six months. But in six months, I want you to be back here. I believe Yitzhak set out on the far trip. And as promised, at the end of six months, he came back. When he came back, his father-in-law looks at him with a mocking smile on his face. He says, now tell me, Levi, you have traveled that far to go and learn something new, new insights. What have you learned? What have you discovered there that you could not discover here? And Rabbi Yitzhak looked his father-in-law straight in his eyes and says, now I know that God exists. His father-in-law looks at him as if he's crazy. Till now, he was an atheist, an agnostic. What was he till now? Now he knows. He says, what do you mean? He says, yes, now I know God exists. For that, you had to travel 600 miles? For that, you had to seek out that strange group of people, the Hasidim? So his father-in-law called in the maid, a young girl, who about 12, 13 years old. And he pointed out the window to the field, the trees, the flowers, the landscape. And he asked her, tell me, where do all these things come from? She looks at him as if he's crazy. Says, what do you mean, where do all these things come from? They come from God. You mean God exists? Of course God exists. What kind of nonsense is this? So Rabbi Yitzhak's father-in-law turns to him and says, you see, she never went to Mesrich. For that matter, she never went to any college or any school of learning right over here. And she also knows that God exists. For that, you had to waste six months' time. Rabbi Yitzhak smiled and answered him, you don't understand. She says God exists. I know God exists. In that little anecdote, we have the essence of what religion is all about and the essence of what our lecture tonight is all about. People make lots, lots of statements. People affirm lots of principles. However, more often than not, they don't even know what they're talking about. They talk it. They say it, but simply because that's the way they have been taught, that's the way they see everybody else says it, or somebody talked them into it, and therefore they just follow the crowd, they jump on the bandwagon and say it. Religion is not about saying things. Religion is not about stating things. The definition of religion more than anything else in life is about knowing things. For religion, by definition, means a relationship between man and God, God and man. It's a relationship not that we have between people. Between people, if you like somebody, you like him, you go with him, you don't go with him. It doesn't make, any mu doesn't make much difference. If you don't have this friend, you have another friend. When you talk about religion, you talk about God, you're talking about something altogether different. There you're talking now about ultimate reality. Another word for religion is truth. Truth and religion are synonymous. There cannot be religion where there is no truth. God and truth 
are synonymous. In Hebrew, in the Jewish tradition, the Hebrew word for truth, emes, is taken as a name of God. And therefore it is a word that we are not allowed to pronounce in such places that God's name is not to be pronounced. In the Jewish tradition, emes is chois moishe lakodesh the very seal, the very sign of God. In Hebrew, the word emes, truth, consists of three letters, aleph, mem, sof. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, mem is the exact middle letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and sof is the very last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, because that is what truth means, beginning, middle, and end. Truth means consistency. Truth means literally everything going from the very beginning to the very end. And that is what religion is all about. To the religious person, God, religion, is everything. To the point that a religious person is willing to lay down his or her life for their belief. To the point that to the religious person, my physical existence, my physical survival means nothing, absolutely nothing, if it is a threat to my soul, if it is a threat to my afterlife, if it is a threat to my spiritual reality. Not only in Judaism, but in every other religion as well. You have a whole long history of martyrs, of people who are willing to lay down their lives because they felt this world, this life, my body, is only something for here and now, it's something transient, here today, gone tomorrow, but what really makes me tick that is my soul, and my soul is spiritual, and my soul lives on after I die, and my soul will be held accountable for the way it spends its time here on this earth. And therefore, spiritual life, spiritual reality, is the only thing that really matters to the religious person. And the physical life is merely a means, by a means of which you realize and you achieve or try to actualize your purpose that which the soul is supposed to achieve here on earth. Religion, therefore, is not, as some people take it, simply something of belief. There's nothing wrong with belief. There's nothing wrong with faith. There's not a single person on earth that ever lived, that lives today or will ever live, that does not use faith. The greatest scientist on earth bases everything he proclaims on faith. He relies on faith when it comes to the criteria for his knowledge, for his basic premises. And once he has certain basic premises, now he experiments and tries to prove them on the empirical level. But the initial premises, the initial things that he starts off with, are acts of faith. So there's nothing wrong with faith. Without faith, we would not survive even one minute. All of us are sitting here today in this uh, synagogue and right now, you are expressing an act of implicit faith that the ceiling is not going to cave in within the next five seconds. If it does cave in, you know where you wind up. And yet, none of you seem to be trembling or scared. For whatever reason, you have decided, no, I'm, I think it looks pretty safe. It looks like a pretty sturdy building. I don't know how long it's standing here, but it looks pretty sturdy. However, in faith itself, there are two kinds. There is the faith that you express by sitting here right now, the faith that is used by the scientist, the faith that is supposed to be used by the religious person, and there is another kind of faith for which there is another word altogether, and that is called credulity. The difference between the two, credulity means you just accept unquestioningly, uncritically, whatever you are being fed. Why do you accept it? It suits my purposes. It sounds attractive. Um, it serves some kind of a purpose, whatever, that is to my use. You don't examine it, you don't check it out. For as long as it works out, fine, I'm happy with it. If it doesn't work out, no problem, I drop it. That is not what I mean by faith. That is called credulity. That's called blind faith. The faith that I'm speaking about when we speak about religion is something altogether different. It is faith, it is belief, but it is belief and faith for which you have reason to believe it. You don't just jump with your eyes closed. You have reasons why you make these assumptions. You have certain foundations. The reason that you sit in here now is because I assume that in Australia they must have building codes as well, and the building has been standing for who knows how long already, 
Uh, so it must have been checked out, who knows? It has, been, it has a track record of safety so far, so therefore for all practical purposes, you assume, even though you don't have a 100% ironclad guarantee, every so often we do read articles in newspapers that buildings cave in, but the probability, the possibility of that is there. The probability of this happening, however, is very slim. The less the probability, the safer you feel. Absolute certainty does not exist in life. And when it comes to religion, therefore, where religion is supposed to be the most important thing for the religious person, more important than literally anything in life, including your life, how much more so then do we have an obligation to check out, to examine, to analyze, to verify that which we believe in, to convince ourselves, to show to ourselves, evidence to ourselves, why do I believe that? What is the foundation? What is the basis? Do I simply jump with my eyes closed, simply because somebody told me so? Or do I have a good, solid reason for accepting and following that particular way of life? If it is simply blind eyes, you are not talking about religion. At best, you're talking idolatry. What kind of idolatry? You're talking about self-worship. You're talking about worshiping and accepting and following that which suits you, which has nothing to do with truth, nothing to do with reality, nothing to do with anything. Religion is probably the hardest thing, the most important thing that we have to examine, that we have to put ourselves really through a test before we can talk about it with any certainty, with any meaningfulness. And it's in that context of what religion is supposed to mean, truth, conviction, with solid foundations, that the idea of evangelizing, the idea of missionizing, the idea of going around and trying to gain converts, new members to whatever one belongs to, is the greatest and most stupid fallacy in the world. It's the very contradiction of what religion is all about. And when you walk down the street and you feel a pain in your leg and you don't know what is wrong with you and you see a shingle hanging out in front of a door where it says John Doe MD and you walk in, you see it's a doctor, fine, I have insurance anyway, so what do I care what he charges? You walk in and you show him your leg, you say, Doc, I have a problem here, what should I do? And the doctor gives one look at it and says, uh oh, this looks bad. This leg has to come off immediately. Are you going to let him take off your leg right there and then? Are you going to run to the nearest hospital and ask him, please take off my leg right there and then? The answer, I think, is quite obvious. You would say no. For some strange reason or another, you feel attached to your leg. <laughs> and therefore, you do not want to get rid of it so fast. At least you're going to ask for a second opinion. At least you're going to ask a specialist in the field. So when it comes to your leg, and what do you care if they cut off your leg? Big deal. Today they have artificial legs. Today they have some such things as bionic man, the bionic six million dollar man, the bionic woman and so forth. Uh, you get a television show and you can do things with your artificial bionic legs that no normal person can do. You're be much better off than before. So what are you afraid of? What are you losing? You can hop around even on one leg. And yet, you're going to go out of your way to make sure that this will not happen. Let's go even a step further. You feel thirsty, you feel hungry, and you see there is uh, some kind of a machine which sells drinks. And it says, I don't know how much a can of Coke costs here in Australia, but let's say the price there on the machine is $10. And you know down the street is a store, and there they sell them for the normal price. 75 cents, how much is it here? 50 cents, $1. Um, are you going to say, well, look here, big deal, $10 here, $10 tomorrow is inflation and recession, tomorrow it isn't worth too much anyway, so I may as well throw in the $10 and get my can of pop. For that, I'm not going to walk down an extra block. I don't think there are too many people that will do that. Unless you're really in a big, big, big rush, and your time is worth money as well, it's worth more than the $10, fine, then you'll do it. But under normal average circumstances, you wouldn't do that. So for a lousy $9, you're going to walk down an extra block to make sure you're not 
you don't feel that you have been fooled, that you have been tricked, that you have been had for the extra nine dollars, then you can get it there for one dollar. So for nine dollars, what is nine dollars today? Nothing. And the same or chances are you'd probably do even for half a dollar. You don't want to feel like a sucker. You will check out, can I get it cheaper? And if, or if you know you can get it cheaper, you'll go over there. When you buy a car, if I got a car for you, only my mother-in-law used it, and only for six months, and just to go to the corner drugstore two blocks down the road, uh, I'll sell it to you, it's worth $10,000 for you, I'll sell it for $5,000. But you have to come give me the money right here and now, sight unseen. Would you do that? The answer is no. You want to see it, you want to check it out, you want to take it to a mechanic, see what's doing under the hood, etc., etc. So when it comes to money, when it comes to business, when it comes to a lousy $9 or even $1, never mind your leg, you go out of your way to check out, to examine, to analyze, to find out, is it, do I get a real McCoy or am I being tricked? If you go so much out of your way for all these other things, which are really ultimately, bottom line, meaningless, how much more so must you go out of your way when it comes to religion? That you cannot take things about religion at face value, just on the say-so or the appearance sake or what have you that people give you. Here's then where the sad topic of religion, of uh, missionizing and cults come in. Over the past so many years, we have been blessed with a plethora of cults throughout the world. What do we call a cult? We have a tendency of calling a cult when you see a group, a group of crazies. They look different, they talk different, they dress different, they eat different. They are different than we are. They stick out like a sore thumb. That we tend to call a cult. Why should we call them a cult? Just because they are or look different? That is not the definition of a cult. Definition of a cult to me is an organization or a group, and I don't care how many people they have, I don't care how many members they have, I don't care what they look like, whether they look even more normal than I do. The definition of a cult is people who follow somebody or something blindfolded, without questioning, without asking, without analyzing. That is a cult. And basically, people who join these cults are people who don't ask questions, are people who are not convinced, are people who are seduced. Simple as that. Seduced, usually, generally, mostly, if not all the time, on a purely emotional level. And that applies more specifically, we are not talking about just about cults, even though this applies to any cult, but the topic tonight is geared more specifically to a new animal, to a new cult, which is called Jews for Jesus or Hebrew Christians, or sometimes they call themselves Messianic Jews, or what have you. What kind of a creature is that? Where does it come from? How did it come about? And how do we deal with it? How should we confront it? How it came about is very simple to see. And incidentally, I will put a warning right here and now, and then later on, as things get hotter, the warning will be repeated. In America, I suppose you have the same here in Australia, when they show movies, I suppose the movies are classified. Adult entertainment only, restricted, parent guidance advised, uh, no admittance without your parent, and so forth. On television, they also sometimes they have shows, and before they show it, they say, viewer's discretion advised, either because of language or content, and so forth. So here I start also off, listener's uh, discretion advised. Um, this is going to be a discussion in which no holds, uh, no bars held, no holds barred, whichever way the expression goes. Um, in which I will be extremely frank, and I will be saying things that shall offend people. And not purposely so, not for the sake of offending people, but simply to spell things out for what they are. So therefore, any screamy souls, it was nice seeing you, have a good night, and perhaps you can meet sometime again. How does the creature, uh, he Hebrew Christians, Messianic Jews, or Jews for J, uh, whatever other names they go by, come about? It comes about with a long, as old as Christianity is. What is Christianity? Christianity is a religion that grew from some ideas and some beliefs that some Jews held some 2,000 years ago, in which they felt that 
some interpretation, some meanings of certain passages in the Jewish Bible, in the Tanakh, what they call the Old Testament, uh, indicate certain directions with regards to a certain individual and his disciples, his apostles, and they are the fulfillment thereof, and therefore this is what true or ultimate Judaism was really all about. The problem they had is that they were a total failure that the Jews just simply did not adopt this new religion. The Jews just simply did not accept these interpretations. They got lots of pagans to do so. Uh, Christianity then essentially grew from these Jewish teachers into one large worldwide religion of converted pagans and heathens. But that presented the Christians with a very serious problem, a theological problem, a psychological problem. If these interpretations are supposed to be the meaning of what the Hebrew prophets had in mind, what the Hebrew Bible is speaking about, then why is it that the Jews of all people, the Jews of all people, to whom these messages were addressed, have rejected it, have denounced it, rejected it, made it meaningless, said it is meaningless, de decried it and stamped it as sheer falsehood and nonsense, decried it as sheer pure heresy? When a pagan comes and hears this is the Bible given by God to whom? To Israel. Through whom? Through the Jewish prophets. Then the pagan, who is not stupid, will simply ask the question, where are the Jews? How come they don't hear it? How come they don't listen to it? How come they don't accept it? That has been a very serious problem. And therefore, from day one, Christianity had to struggle with this dilemma and therefore has an agenda of converting the Jew simply to bring the Jew into the fold, to show legitimacy to itself, to show that there is a legitimate chain going back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses at Sinai, right through Jewish history into the continuation of what they claim to be Christianity to be. And as the New Testament itself says, go out into the hedges and compel them to enter, adding, and to the Jew first. Christians would rather have one Jewish convert than 10,000 heathens. The one Jewish convert means to them legitimacy. The one Jewish convert means to them continuation. The one Jewish convert means to them an unbroken chain that they can show we are the legitimate historical fulfillment of that which Jewish tradition is talking about. That was their agenda. And it has been the agenda from day one as I say, going right back to the New Testament. What were the realities? The realities is that it was a total failure. They tried, they cajoled, they begged, they bribed, they did literally everything possible, but total failure. Why? Because to the Jew, as for that matter, to any other religious believer of any other religion, to forsake your faith is the worst thing you can do is to deny your identity. The worst word in the Jewish uh, vocabulary is to be called, the worst insult is to be called a Meshumet. A Meshumet is one who has forsaken Judaism and joined Christianity or another religion. That's the worst thing that you can possibly call somebody. The worst insult. There's no lower name than that. You can call them any other name in the book. It doesn't even come close to that. And that is in the very blood and in the very soul, in the very mind, and in the very heart of every Jew. And therefore Christianity, in their mission to the Jews, was a total failure. When they saw that it didn't go in good ways, they tried different ways. And then we get the sorry history of the basic contact between Christianity, especially as it started to become state religion in the Roman Empire, and then in other areas, in Europe, and then in other places in the world. Now they could not only go and try and persuade with which they failed, now they could also go with the cross in one hand and the sword in the other. And come to the Jew and say, either you kiss this or this kisses you. And that has been the history of 2,000 years of Jewish-Christian relationship, of Jewish-Christian dialogue. We have the story of the Crusaders, which decimated hundreds of Jewish communities on the way, we have the story of the Inquisition, we have the story of all the pogroms, and all these things ending and concluding in the Holocaust. 
Let no one fool him or herself. The Holocaust, the gruesome murder of six million Jews in the Nazi Germany, is a direct result, a direct product and effect of New Testament, Christianity, and Christian teachings. There is today not a single decent Christian theologian in the world anywhere that does not admit this. Not one of all Christian persuasions. Why again? Because of this obsession to the Jew first. Seeing that they failed, first with persuasion, and then with torture, with murder, with inhumanity of the worst kind that mankind has ever seen, they saw it's a failure. But the problem to them remained. Thus they invented a new thing, and this goes back essentially in larger format to the 19th century, what they call the Hebrew Christian mission, or the Christian missions to the Jews, in which they got, you have the odd one that somehow fell into their hands, and then they really pried them up and say, now you go to take the converted Jew, the Meshumet, and tell them, now you go and try to get others. You can talk Yiddish, and so forth. But even with all these things, it was still a total failure because the word Christian, the Christianity, the word Jesus, the cross, these are like red, putting put red in front of a bull when you put it in front of a Jew. We have had our experience and our dialogue and our conversations about what these concepts mean. Thus they saw that this is a failure again. So in the 20th century, they hit upon a new idea. First they changed the name to the Hebrew Christian Alliance. But Hebrew Christian Alliance, and let nobody fool himself or herself, these are purely Christian organizations. Purely Christian organizations funded and supported and pushed by the Christian churches. I don't know what particular churches are so active over here, but as far as the, uh, the North American continent is concerned, there it is mainly the Baptist churches, but basically it is every single church without exception. But it's only the ones who were the most active and the ones uh, most involved in the funding thereof. So they tried that. And the new catch was that, no, you do not become a Christian. You become a Hebrew Christian. So you can still retain something of your identity. But even that was a failure, because again, it's Hebrew Christian. And where did it take you? They took you to church. What did they feed you? The New Testament, the Christian practices, the Christian rituals. As this turned out into a further failure, they finally hit upon a new idea, and they called it Jews for J. And they use now a completely new technique. What is the new technique? Now they no longer use the word Christian. Christian, the word Christian is taboo. What is the word they use now? Jew, Jewish. They now come with the slogan, it's the most Jewish thing for a Jew to do to accept the Jewish redeemer the Jewish savior, namely Yeshu J. And they tell you, don't become a Christian. They will even go so far as to condemn Christianity to the Jew. They will tell you Christians are all rotten animals. The Christians, look what they have done to you Jews. Don't become a Christian. And they are Christians themselves. They are funded. They're all ordained ministers. The head of that organization, uh, Mark Rosen, is an ordained minister of the Baptist Church. But that is the slogans that they come out with. And they will tell you, look here, we want you should know that you are Jewish. We want you to be conscious that you are Jewish. We want you to be proud of your Jewishness. We want you to go to synagogue. We want you to wear a king size or queen size Star of David. They even started wearing tzitzis. They even started wearing yarmulkes on their head all day long throughout the week. And they start teaching them Hebrew. They start using their Hebrew names if they didn't have any because they grew up as Gentiles. Most of them, as a matter of fact, are Gentiles, out are Gentiles. So they pretend to have Jewish names. Mark Rosen no longer calls himself Mark Rosen, but Moshe Rosen. And not just Moses Rosen. No, that wouldn't do. Not Moshe Rosen. No, Moshe. That has a Heimische sound to it. That means I'm really part of the family. And likewise with all the other ones. And now the slogan is a completely different one. And here they have been successful, suddenly. Because now it is no longer to their victims a question of schmat. Now they are told, look here, forget about the church, forget about Christianity, forget about all this kabul over there, 
you are a Jew, when they had uh, the demonstrations for Russian Jews, they came for, uh, up in front. When they have demonstrations for the State of Israel, they're right up front. They come and identify and do everything possible to identify as Jews, to get themselves out as Jews, and to make them feel proud of being Jews. But of course, the agenda is something altogether different. That this is the back door in to overcome the basic fundamental block that the Jew has, the aversion that he has to conversion, to Christianity, to anything that is alien and far removed from Judaism. The way they go about it is not only in terms of stressing and emphasizing Jewishness, but of course, as missionaries have done throughout the ages, by taking the Bible and opening up and say, look here, Genesis this, and Exodus this, and Leviticus this, and Isaiah this, and Jeremiah this, and Ezekiel this, they all point to that which you are believing in, and therefore that is what is the most Jewish thing to do. The slogan they use is, we don't want you to be just a Jew. We want you to be a whole Jew, a complete Jew. Right now you're not a complete Jew. You are lacking the salt and pepper. You have everything, but now add a little salt and pepper to believe in you know who, and that will make you complete, that will make you perfect. Like I said, this is not something new, except the techniques, the tactics are new. And because of these tactics, what is a modern terminology called false advertising, um, they have been more successful than they have ever been throughout the past 2,000 years. <coughs> to be sure, the ones they catch, invariably, without exception, and I repeat, without exception, are Jewish kids or Jewish adults, mainly kids or elderly, who know absolutely nothing about the Judaism, who have no background in it whatsoever don't know how to hold the Jewish Bible right side up, just as their missionaries don't know how. And thus they prey on their ignorance, they prey on their susceptibility, and especially as these are people who are looking for something. There are people who are looking for content, and here they come and tell them, look here, you're Jewish, you're searching, you're looking, I have an answer for you. And it's your own answer, it's from your own background, it's from your own tradition, it's from your own history, it is your own identity. The arguments that they use, especially when it comes to biblical passages, which is in essence all they can come up with, is not, not one argument that is new. Every one of the biblical passages that they throw at them, every one of the booklets or books that they publish and throw about, the pamphlets, which also come with phony marks with false advertising, they even advertise Hasidic concerts, Hasidic services, and show pictures on these things which make it look as if it is a genuine, authentic Jewish affair until you come in and then either outright or subliminal in whichever way they go at them with all kinds of sorts of seductions. Uh, the arguments which they use based on the Bible, not one of them is original. And here comes in the, the falsehoods, the hypocrisy of it all. Every one of these passages that they quote, every one of the passages that they have printed, are passages that have been thrown at us Jews for 2,000 years. There's not one that is original. And every one of these passages has been answered. In medieval times, the Jews were forced into public debates. When they saw they couldn't get us one way and they couldn't get us the other way, so they had either they had some Shum Meshumodim or they had some very learned priest and what have you, who figured, oh, I'm smart enough. I'm so convinced in my faith, I guarantee you, I can prove to the Jew that if this becomes a public debate, that our interpretation of the Bible is correct. And thus, through state power, Jews were compelled. Jews don't like to have discussions as we have here today. Jews don't like to have debates about religion because it's a futile waste of time. It's not going to convince anybody. And thus, they, but they tried, they still have this hope. And therefore, Jews always avoided that, but they were very often forced into that. They were forced by the church to engage in public debates, in which the priest would stand and question them. Here you have this passage, here you have this tradition from your own, which talks about the Messiah, which talks about the Savior, and here the Bible says this. Doesn't that obviously mean this, and doesn't that obviously mean that? 
And the deal that was usually made at the beginning of the debate, Jews had no choice in that, they were just presented with the terms of the deal, is that if the priest convinces you, you have no answer, then you and the whole community will have to convert, forcible conversions, or face the other alternative, which is death. If the Jew happens to win the debate, no harm done, we'll find another priest tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, then next week. These debates have been held from early medieval times to as late as the 17th century. These debates are on record. They have been recorded not just by us, they have been recorded by the Christians themselves. They are available in every language that you can possibly imagine. Initially it was Latin, and then Greek, and French, and Spanish, they have all been translated. Every single debate that has ever been held between Jew and Christian has been won by the Jews. There is not one single passage, not one single passage that Christians have ever come up with, not one, in 2,000 years, that we have not shown them the falsehood of their claims, the fallacy of their interpretation, the meaningless of their approach. Not one. Most people would have the slightest interest, the slightest commitment to truth, they would not come today and ask the same questions. Because all I have to do is, my dear friend, before you talk to me, do me a favor, give me a break, go to the library, and I guarantee you that in the libraries here in Sydney and every other city, you can find texts of these debates as well. Go there, study that, and then come back to me. But no, they are not, they are not interested. How did the Jews answer these debates, essentially? Showing consistently throughout history how they have taken these passages out of context, or they have interpreted them in such wild ways, which have absolutely nothing to do with anything messianic, nothing whatsoever, and just kind of forced these interpretations into it. Totally wild. If you were to give that to anybody else, looking open-minded at it, there's no way in the world that would even see by the faintest stretch of imagination what this means. This has been the history of it. Which means in plain English, that there's nobody to talk to even. They're not interested in truth, they're not interested in reason, they're interested in bombarding people who don't know the first thing about what is happening, just as they themselves don't know. They have convinced themselves, credulity, blind faith, and they feel since they have this strong faith, then obviously everybody else must see it that way as well. When I got involved in fighting cults and missionaries, my initial approach was the same as traditionally historical. I used to answer them, basically what it says in all these texts, look here, what do you want? This is what it means. Read the verse before, read the verse after, and still come and tell me now what it's really talking about. How do you get the messianic passage into this and so forth? But you may as well talk to the wall, it means nothing. And even if they admit it, even if they say, okay, I see your point, I still get the bottom line, okay, that's your way of looking at it but there may be another way of looking at it. And therefore, back to square one, and on to the next customer. Me, somehow, they no longer bother. Not only they no longer bother me, but they don't even allow their people to talk to me or to come even close, within uh, 100 uh, meters of me. I've been pronounced the Antichrist himself, and I'm very proud of that. <laughs> they've held special prayer sessions for me, and they've circled my, my house, they've been following me, walking to the synagogue and that, trying from all ways and means. By now they've given up on that as well. When did they start giving up on that? Because once I started taking off my gloves. Because of all, I came to a point, I said, hey, that's a waste of time. We have to take a new tack with them. Why should I be the one to defend himself? Let's change the ground rules. I'm going to out on the attack. Let them defend themselves. And now comes the second warning, listeners' discretion advised. Because what I'm going to say now will really sound very offensive to many people, purposely so. But when you hear me out till the end, you'll see there's nothing offensive, offensive about it at all. So you have to, if you are still decide to stay, now you have to stay till the end. How I go over to the attack is the following way. I say, let's forget about Judaism. Let's forget about the Jewish Bible. 
Let's forget about what the Jewish prophets have to say, because regardless what I say, you don't listen to me anyway. You're going to give me your interpretation and the way you see it, and regardless how irrational and absurd and stupid it sounds, it means nothing to you. So you know what? Let's switch, let's move to the New Testament. After all, you are trying to convince me to become a Christian. You are trying to convince me that in Christianity lies the answer. That Christianity is the ideal way of life, the godly way of life. The ideal of human morality. And then I tell them, look here, I did my homework, and I've decided to read up on that. I want to know, after all, and I've, I have an obligation to be honest, to be objective, to be open-minded, and listen to the, what the other person has to say. And lo and behold, going through the New Testament, look what I found. All of a sudden, I find a completely different picture than what they paint me. The Prince of Peace, the Savior of mankind, all of a sudden turns out to me a completely different picture the exact opposite of whatever they say of him. And I quote a passage which appears in Matthew and in Luke. When this Prince of Peace, the Savior of mankind, speaks and says, Think not that I have come to bring peace into the world. I did not come to bring peace, but strife, war, to set a household against itself, to say the father against his, uh, the, the children and children against the father, a mother against the daughter and daughter against the mother. That's Prince of Peace. And that's not repeated once, but again. This Prince of Peace, who has so much compassion and tells you to turn the other cheek, it means we, the Jews, have to turn the other cheek every time they attack us. What about them? He says about himself, bring my enemies before me so that I may slay them. Talk about humanity. Talk about concern for all of mankind. After all, they try to convert all of mankind. The New Testament tells us a story. After all these miracles that he performed and got a reputation for, there was a Samaritan woman whose daughter was afflicted. And she hears, here is the great savior. Here is the great miracle worker. So she follows him, running after him. Please, I beg you, heal my daughter. Save her. He doesn't pay any attention to her. And she keeps following, and she keeps screaming, and she keeps begging. And his disciples couldn't take it anymore. And they said to him, send her away. Let's get rid of her. Or maybe you should do something about her. What did the great Prince of Peace say? I did not come but to the lost sheep of Israel. It is not meek to take the children's bread and cast it unto dogs. In other words, it's a Samaritan woman. She's not Jewish. If she's not Jewish, she's a dog. She's an animal. I'm here only for the lost sheep of Israel. And therefore that which I owe them, I'm not going to throw this out to those Gentiles, to those dogs. That in the end he did heal her because she simply didn't let go. Because she came back with a beautiful retort to him. And she says, even if I'm a dog, don't you throw the morsels that are left on the table to the dogs on the floor? That's the humanity. Other passages. If that is not enough, the scandal, which Christian theologians call the scandal of the New Testament. Because to this day they haven't found a solution how to get around it. He did a lot of traveling. And once he came back from one of his trips and he was very tired and he was very exhausted. He was hungry, he was starving, he was thirsty. He was still far from the city. And he sees in the distance a fig tree. Oh, I'm a chaya. finally, solution to my problem. He comes to the fig tree, he looks, lo and behold, there were no figs on it. What does he do? What would you do in such a case? I turn around and I move on. He did not turn around and move on. He stood there and started cursing out the fig tree. Let no fruit grow on thee forevermore. And then the New Testament proudly relates, no fruits ever grew on that fig tree anymore. Poor fig tree, what did he do to you? Didn't touch you. And if that is not enough, 
Mark gives us a reason why there were no fruits on the tree. In another book of the New Testament, says Mark, because it was not the season for figs. The boy, Michel Euland, what do you want? It's not the season. What has the tree done to you? What does he do? He flares in a rage, starts cursing it out. Then there's the verse which perhaps disturbs me more than anything. There's a verse in the New Testament which very often you can see outside the bulletin boards of churches hanging, which I find, and listen carefully, the foulest, most abusive sentence ever uttered in all of human literature, which makes Hitler's Mein Kampf look like a nursery rhyme. What is that sentence? I am the way, I am the truth, and no man cometh unto the Father except through me. I cannot think of another sentence that had ever been uttered in all of human literature that is so responsible for so much suffering, for so much inhumanity, for so much torture, for so much whatever has possibly happened, the, the lowest of the lowest in all mankind, but that sentence. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. It's a one-way street. You are not part of my group. You don't follow my way. You're finished. You're condemned. You're anathema, as it says elsewhere. If people wonder why the Christian churches were silenced during the Holocaust, all they have to do is read the New Testament. Read the book of Romans, where Paul declares the powers that be are ordained by God. Whosoever therefore rises against the powers that be, rises against God, even if they do evil. In other words, if Hitler is in power, if Hitler sets up concentration camps, gas chambers, that is the way appointed by God, the way of God. You try to fight that, you're fighting God himself. Then the book of Corinthians, what I call the credo of the missionary, excuse me, the credo of the hypocrite, where Paul speaks about himself. Paul was a very interesting figure. Paul is the real founder of Christianity, not Yeshu. Paul was a person who, he's the one who really started Christianity in going out to the pagans, to the heathens, to convert them. He saw time in the Jewish land, amongst the Jewish people, waste of time. Forget it, doesn't get anywhere. Then he started traveling, the heathens, oh, that's just like that. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, he gets these converts in the hundreds, in the thousands, wherever he goes. Now, this Paul, when he went out there, coming to the pagans, remember here again, the first Christians were Jews. And the first Christians were observant Jews. Yeshu, the Christian savior, declared that you must follow the Torah, every single law of the Torah. Heaven and earth shall cease before one jot or one tittle of the law shall cease. Lest you be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall be the least in the kingdom to come. In other words, not only the Torah, the written Torah, do you have to observe, but even the declarations, the pronouncement, the rules, the laws proclaimed by the Pharisees, whom Jesus condemned as hypocrites, phonies, everything under the sun, he says, unless you listen to what they say, their religious pronouncements, you shall be the least in the kingdom to come. So according to him, every single detail of Jewish law, of the Jewish Bible, of the Talmud, of rabbinic law, rabbinic declarations, must be observed or else. When did Christianity change? After he died, after the crucifixion. Christianity changed through Paul. So Paul who proclaimed, if the law still applies, Christ died in vain. So the only way to explain, hey, here the Messiah has come, the Messiah was put on the cross, the Messiah is dead, nothing in the world has changed. What happened? Where's the messianic redemption? So therefore he had to bring in a radical change. What is the radical change? No longer shall you be saved by actions, but by faith. The law no longer applies. If the law still applies, Christ died in vain. So therefore, he abrogated the law. He started condemning the law. 
you are cursed under the law, etc., etc. Now this Paul, coming to the Gentiles, however, before he started changing the rules, came, now imagine, he comes to them and says, look here, I want you to convert you, I want to convert you. To convert me to what? To truth. The Messiah has arrived. What must I do? Well, first of all, you must circumcise yourselves. Then you have to know that you have to keep Shabbat. Then you have to know you have to keep the dietary laws. He threw the book at them. Now the pagan said, it's nice meeting you, goodbye, have a good time. None of them, of course, would follow that. Seeing that none of them is interested in doing these things, and I can't blame them, who wants to put a straitjacket on? So therefore he says, okay, special deal for you. An offer you can't refuse. You don't have to do any of these things. All you have to do is just accept and believe in the Savior. That's it. And to prove his point, he used to sit down with them, eat with them, drink with them. Kosher, non-kosher, who gives a hoot? That's on his travels. The moment he came back, the New Testament tells us, he came back to the land of Israel, he came back to Jerusalem. First thing he did, he jumped into a mikveh. To purify himself from having been defiled by these Gentile contacts from having been defiled by this non-kosher food, from having been defiled by these non-Jewish practices. Then he rushed to the temple to bring a sin offering for having violated Jewish law. And then he lived again for a few weeks in the Jewish community. Till the next trip. Next trip, back. History repeats itself again. You guys don't have to do it, and he sits down to eat and drink with them, coming back, this and that. And if somebody asks, but my goodness, what is the man doing? So Paul explains in the book of Corinthians, I am made all things unto all men. And to the Jew I come as a Jew, and to those that are under the law I come as those that are under the law, and to those that are without the law I come as without the law. I am made all things to all men in order that I might gain the more for you know who. This to me is the credo of hypocrisy. It's the very essence of what hypocrisy is all about. There are no principles, there are no rules, there is no truth. Nothing matters, there is only one thing that matters. Produce. Get the numbers. Get the converts. And so I have a whole, whole list going through the New Testament. This is just a fraction, a tiny fraction of passages which are outright offensive, obscene. And obscene is a very kind word to be used for that. And I come to the Christian and say to him, look here, my friend. This is what you want me to convert to? This is what you want me to accept? This is the worst of the worst. Low lives, even thieves have honor among themselves. Here there's no honor at all. Hypocrisy, nothing matters, nobody else matters, even poor vegetables, a fig tree. Then they come back to me, oh, there's another passage, it's not a beauty. How do you become a true Christian? How do you become a true disciple? Yea, he who hates not his father and hates not his mother, hates not his brethren, hates not his sisters, hates not his wife and children, shall not be, hates not himself, shall not be my disciple. Direct quote. Hatred. It's a book literally heating, uh, teaching and preaching hatred, racism, obnoxious uh, empire building, chauvinism, it's the literally the worst of the worst that one can possibly imagine. And I say to my Christian friends, and I do have Christian friends, <laughs> what do you do with this? What do you do with this? And then the response is to me, hey, 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 hold it, the say Rabbi. What you have just read to me is not what it says. I say, I beg your pardon. Here is the book. I show them chapter and verse. And I show them it's all read in context, not one word out of context. Show me where I have misread or misinterpreted. I'm not interpreting one word. I'm reading literally the words as they're written and as they're printed. So then the response is, yeah, you're right. 100% right. They're not accusing you of falsifying. However, you don't understand. These passages are not to be taken literally. These passages have to be interpreted. For example, the passage about hate, hate your mother, hate your father, hate your wife, hate your children, hate your brethren, hate your sister, hate everybody, 
And if not, you can't be my disciple. They say, what that means is that your first loyalty belongs to him. That when it comes to a conflict between doing something for your parents or your spouse or your children, and that goes directly, diametrically opposed to what God wants from you, or what they say, what you know who wants from you, then they say you have to cast them all aside, everything aside, and just go with what he says. I have no problem with that interpretation. Because technically, every religion teaches the same thing. Every moral system teaches the same thing. If there are principles of morality, if there are principles of truth, they reign supreme. And no personal or emotional considerations can outweigh and overrule morality and truth. So I have no problem with that. And they say the same applies to the other passages. You have to read not what it says. You have to read in between the lines. You have to read behind the words. Okay, so he was a lousy writer. He had a lousy speech writer for him. He should have expressed himself in a bit more delicate fashion. But there is a deeper meaning to it and so forth. And then I listen to that and I say, are you sure? They say, yes. And then I ask them, but maybe I should take these passages literal? So they say to me, oh no, Christianity throughout the ages has taken these passages with that deeper meaning. Well, in reality, I've seen the opposite. In reality, even all the interpretations of the gift, they haven't come up with one interpretation yet for the story with the fig tree. But in any case, I say, and I ask them, what do you mean? You mean you have a tradition of different interpretation? And they say, yeah. Going right back to the beginning, right back to the source. They say, yes. And then I sit and listen carefully, and I shake my head and I say, you know, what you say makes sense. And I'm willing to accept your interpretation and not my literal reading. And then you can see a smile from ear to ear on the face. They're happy. There is hope for him yet. He's coming around. <laughs> but then, of course, comes the punchline. And my punchline is a very simple one. I say to them, look here. All these passages, which at face value, are absolutely obscene, and there's no better word for it, I'm ready and willing to surrender and say there may be a completely different meaning to them. And that meaning perhaps only those who have been born into the Christian tradition, who are the heirs of a chain of interpretation from day one to this day, only they would know it. I'm an outsider, first one to admit it. I come from completely outside, a completely different tradition. I come from Judaism. I as an outsider cannot come now and jump and into that book, into that text, into that tradition, into the practices, and tell them, look here, I think that this is what you are saying, this is what you mean. Only the Christian can tell me what the New Testament is really all about. But, if it's goose, good for the goose, what is it? It's good for the gander. The punchline then is with regards to Judaism. Only the Christian can tell me what J.C. really meant through his tradition. But by the same token, then, only the Jew can know and tell you what the Jewish Bible is about. What kind of a chutzpah do they have to come Johnny come lately, hundreds and over thousand years after we have our Bible, a Bible given by God through the Jewish prophets in the Jewish language to the Jewish people with a Jewish message addressed to the Jews, given to the Jews, transmitted by the Jews, interpreted by the Jews, preserved by the Jews. And now comes this Johnny come lately Christian who can't hold our Bible right side up, knows it at best from a translation of a translation of another translation, and he dares come and tell me what the Bible is talking about? He can't even read the original text. And even if he could read the original text, where do you come off telling me what it's talking about? In other words, for 2,000 years, we Jews didn't know what we had. For 2,000 years, we Jews were deaf, blind, and dumb. For 2,000 years, we got messages. For 2,000 years, we got teachings, which we had no idea what the heck they're talking about, until Johnny come lately, who could not read Hebrew, 
The apostles could not read Hebrew. Listen carefully. The apostles could not read Hebrew, did not know Hebrew. They barely knew Greek. And they come to me and they tell me what the Jewish Bible is all about. Case closed. You want to take your passages in the New Testament and give them a different meaning? I'm game. And I'll be the first one to admit that I, as an outsider, and certainly who does not have a positive view of this, has no right to impose my interpretation on it. How much thousands of times, millions of times so, do they fall by the side when it comes to our tradition? Case closed. There's nothing further to discuss. You want to know what the Jewish Bible means? Don't come to me and say, doesn't it mean this? I say to him, shut up. You want to know what the Jewish Bible wants to say? Sit down and I will tell you. And what I tell you, that's the only thing that you can take. And anything else is sheer rubbish and garbage. Okay, so nothing further to discuss. You want to take it differently? And they interpret, if they were to take my Bible and read literally what it says, they might have a case. There is not a single passage that they take literal. There is not a single passage that they take in context, which I am doing with theirs. Case closed. Nothing further to discuss. And they, they turn silent. Now, some people have accused me in the course of time that I'm using this as a cop-out, that perhaps I'm afraid to confront the passages directly. So I tell them, look here, you want to take the passages directly? I'm game. Let me give you two examples. The two most common passages quoted by them. One is Isaiah 7.14. The other one is Isaiah chapter 53. These are the two most common quoted, going right back to the New Testament. Isaiah 7.14 is the passage where, which they call the virgin birth passage. I mean, so much is based on the virgin birth. Traditionally, historically, Jews have answered them. What kind of rubbish are you talking about? First of all, the whole chapter in Isaiah has nothing to do with any Messiah or Messianic era. The chapter is speaking quite explicit about a war going on at that time under King Asa, in which the Jewish people were close to defeat. It was a hopeless situation. And God tells the prophet Isaiah, go tell the king not to worry. You'll be victorious. And go tell the king he should ask you for a sign, for proof that he has nothing to worry about. And the prophet goes to the king, and the king says, I'm not going to test God. I'm not going to ask him for any signs. And then God said to Isaiah, I'm going to give him a sign nonetheless. This shall be your sign. The Almo shall become pregnant. Where your love Ben give birth to a son. Where Koros Shmoy Emmanuel, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. That is the sign. So traditionally, what we have answered, and then indeed this happened, they were victorious, case closed. That's all Isaiah is talking about there. Comes Christianity and says, eh, 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 hold it. The Hebrew word, the Almo, they translate as virgin. And they say that God gave Isaiah the sign, behold, the virgin shall become pregnant, shall conceive, and shall bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. So we have answered them, look here, this, who is talking about the Messiah here? We are talking about a situation, a condition which existed 700 years before he was born. Is that going to be a sign for the king and for the Jewish people that 700 years later somebody is going to be born? What kind of nonsense is that? Secondly, they say, the word Almo means virgin. The Hebrew word for virgin is psulo. Almo means young woman. The same as Elaine means young man. Yemei alumaseinu, the days of our youth. We're not talking the days of our virginity. We talk about the days of our youth. This has been the, the and there is even proof brought from various other verses where you see that Almo could not possibly be relate there to a virgin. So they say, yeah, ba ba, psulo means virgin, almo can also mean virgin, etc., etc. This has been, but you can talk your head blue, it's not going to go anywhere. Since that is not going to go anywhere, I have chosen again a different way. And I say to the Christians, you know what? 
You want Isaiah chapter 7 to be messianic? Fine, I'm game. Let it be messianic. You want Alma to be a virgin? Have no problem. Let her be a virgin. What do I care? <laughs> Everything you want. But I'm going to ask you a question now. What was the sign? What is the sign that God is giving? So they look at me and say, are you crazy? What do you mean, what is the sign? Can you think of a greater sign than a virgin, virgin, a virgin getting pregnant? I say, no, I can't. That is indeed, <coughs> indeed miraculous, supernatural, phenomenal. If I would know of such a case, yes, I would have to say this is divine intervention. Ah, see? That is a sign. I said, just a moment. When you give me a sign, I have to see the sign. I have to recognize the sign. Can you tell me anyone in that generation that would know that she was a virgin? Did she run around with a certificate from a gynecologist that he has examined her and found her intact? Yes, she's a virgin. If she doesn't have a certificate like that, who would know that she's a virgin? Imagine your daughter comes home, Mom, I'm pregnant. I didn't fool around. Didn't see any boys for miles around. Just happened like that. <coughs> Immaculate conception. Would you take that serious? If you don't take that serious, why should I take that serious? Who would know that she's a virgin? So obviously that is not the sign. There's no way in the world that you could possibly imagine even that the pregnancy, the conception of the child is a sign in terms of virginity. That is number one. Number two, I say to them, if you read that verse, what does it say? Even in your interpretation, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And what does it say then? And she shall call his name Emmanuel. I've checked the New Testament from the beginning to the end, from the front to the back, and from the back to the front, and back again and back again. Not once. Not one single time. Is Yeshu ever called Emmanuel? Not once. What happened to the prophecy? So they tell me, you know, Emmanuel means God with us. Of course Emmanuel means God with us. Just as Abraham means an exalted father, and Yitzhak means he shall rejoice. And Jacob means the heel. And Moses means drawn from the water. Every Hebrew name has a meaning. But you will not find a single biblical passage throughout the whole Bible that the Bible says, so-and-so shall be called by this and that name, that that person is not called by that name. And indeed, these names are meaningful. So therefore, if that is supposed to be messianic, let it be messianic, I say, everything you say. Let it be a virgin birth. But one thing I can tell you for sure, it's definitely, most definitely, not him. Because that prophecy has never been fulfilled in him. Case closed. Then they wonder and say, oh yeah, if it's not him, then who else is it? Say, no problem. I know who it is. Who? Well, I know of a certain individual whose mother was a relatively young woman when he was born. And when he was born, she called his name Emmanuel. His full name is Emmanuel Schochert, myself. <laughs> So now the Messiah has been revealed and exposed. <laughs> For that matter, I have an advantage which he never had. According to Jewish tradition, the Messiah has to come from King David. And according to Jewish tradition, as we read in the Torah reading of this week, explicitly, and as we read in so many other, the very first chapter of Numbers, and in so many other passages, genealogy in Judaism, religion is determined by the mother. Genealogy, tribal affiliation, hereditary laws are determined exclusively through the father. He had no father, did he? No father? Forget it. He can't be a king over Israel. His mother descended from King David, to King David. Mazel tov. Therefore what? Means nothing. Absolutely nothing. My family has a genealogical table, also my mother's side and my father's side. <laughs> no problem. So if you're looking for qualifications, you're looking for a viable candidate, I'm volunteering for the throne of Israel. <laughs> Not just volunteering, but as of tonight, I think the time has come, I should demand it. 
That's so much for Isaiah 714. Even granting them every mistranslation and every misinterpretation that they want to take for it, there is no way in the world, no way in the world, that they can show that this has anything to do with him. Let's take Isaiah 53, the suffering servant passage. The traditional interpretation of that has been, by many, they tried to escape the confrontation from Christianity and say the suffering servant, that is the people of Israel. And 2,000 years certainly has shown that we are the suffering servant. However, uh, to be true and honest, there is solid, sufficient evidence in Jewish tradition, going right back to the Talmud and medieval commentators, no, Isaiah 53 speaks indeed about the Messiah, speaks about Mashiach. So I take it, you know, I, by now you know I'm very frank and open, I take frontal attacks. I say 53, I give you everything you want. Messianic, Moshiach, the works. But regardless what, one thing I can tell you, it is not him. Then they ask me, what do you mean it's not him? How do you know it's not him? Maybe it is him. I say, no. From Isaiah 53, it says right there that it couldn't possibly be him. Where does it say that? Well, it talks there about the suffering servant, suffering for the sins and the iniquities of his nation and the world. And then it says, I think verse 6, like a lamb, dumb, being led to slaughter, opened not its mouth. That's the suffering servant. Whoever it is, I say, one thing I know, it can't be him. Why not? Because he did not keep his mouth shut. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Go back to the New Testament. According to Christianity, he was born, he came into this world, for what? To save mankind. Save mankind how? Through his vicarious suffering, by dying on the cross, with his blood, he cleansed the blood of all mankind. Which means, obviously, the crucifixion was the intended end, was his whole purpose here on earth. That's what he came for. No crucifixion, his mission has failed. And what happened with this crucifixion? There he is being led, he comes to the cross, they nail him on the cross, what does he do? He cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Imagine. At the height of his career, <laughs> physically as well as otherwise, having reached the apex of his whole purpose in life, that for which he came into this earth. What does he do in that last moment before he breathes out his last? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Millions of Jews have walked to the gas chambers. Millions of Jews have walked to the stake, were burned alive, skinned alive, torn alive. How? crying out, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echot. Millions of Jews went to the death proclaiming their faith in God. They went to the death singing, not just proclaiming their faith in God. For millions of Jews, this was indeed the greatest moment in their life. We have the story of Rabbi Akiva the greatest teacher of the Talmud, who was condemned to death for one sin, violating the Roman prohibition to teach Torah. And the Roman governor wasn't satisfied in just killing him, in just executing him. No, for what he did, saving Judaism, he was going to be tortured to death. How? By taking pitchforks and literally tearing pieces of flesh from his body, piece by piece, until he died. And while he was lying there, pieces of flesh being torn from his body, he was lying there smiling, just about laughing. Nobody could take it. His disciples said, Rebbe, what is happening? How can you laugh at a moment like this? The Roman executioner stood there. You must be a demon. There's no way you could be a human being. 
and undergo this suffering and lie here smiling. And what did he answer them? He said, what do you mean why am I smiling? This is the most glorious moment in my life. Every day, morning and night, I say the Shema, I proclaim my belief in God, I proclaim the unity of God, and I proclaim how I have to love God. You shall love Hashem your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Every day I proclaim that. Every day I affirm that. But all my life I was wondering, and all my life I was waiting, do I really mean it? It's so easy to say it with your mouth. But do I really mean it? If and when I shall be put to the test, would I still say it? Would I still believe it? Today it is happening, he says. Today I'm being killed for being a Jew. Today I'm being killed and murdered and tortured for my faith and belief in God and strengthening that amongst others. Is this not the most glorious moment in my life that I can lay down my life for God? That has been the Jewish attitude. And he, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And not only Rabbi Akiva, not only the martyrs in Jewish history, in Christian history as well. How many Christians went in the arenas of Rome and were fed to the lions, affirming their faith in their religion, in their God? How many Christians, how many Muslims, how many members of all religions in the world were willing to sacrifice their lives, proudly standing up, happy that they can prove their faith in their God by laying down their lives. And he, the so-called savior of mankind, the role model, the one who comes to die for the sake of mankind. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Like a lamb, dumb, being led to slaughter, opened not his mouth. That is the suffering servant. Whoever it is, I don't know, but one thing I can tell you, it is for sure not him. And if that is not enough, there is another verse in the same chapter 53, where it talks about the suffering servant, how he goes through his sufferings, and then God promises him a reward. Don't worry. Yarich yomim yirezera. He shall live long as a reward for his suffering, and he shall see seed. He shall see children, he shall see offspring. Now, unless there is a secret history of you-know-who, according to all records, Christians and non-Christians, when was he crucified? He was about 30 years old, 33 years old. Give him another three years for all I care. Give him another 10 years. Is that long life promised to the suffering servant? He shall see offspring. Where are they? Did he have a mistress somewhere on the side? Where is she? Where are his children? Where are his grandchildren? The Yerezera shall see offspring in the Jewish Bible. The Hebrew has only one connotation, physical offspring, not disciples, not students. Where are they? Who is the suffering servant? Whoever it is, one thing we know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Whoever it is, it is not him. It can't be him. He doesn't fit the bill. Aside of the fact that he simply does not fill the bill of a Messiah altogether. According to the Jewish Bible, according to Jewish prophets, what is the Messiah supposed to do? The Messiah is supposed to redeem the Jewish people. The Messiah is supposed to rebuild the temple. The Messiah is supposed to usher in an era of peace and harmony to all mankind. The Messiah is going to bring about peace and harmony between all human beings without exception. Jew and Gentile, believers, non-believers, whoever it is. A peace, an era of peace and harmony, not only amongst all mankind, but even amongst the animal kingdom. The wolf shall lie with the lamb, the lion with the kid. The, the lion shall eat straw like the cow. None shall harm or hurt one another. No animal shall harm another animal, let alone a human being. And certainly the human beings will no longer harm. The sword shall be changed into plowshares. No more arms raised, nothing ultimate utopia. That is Messiah. That is Messianic age. What has happened since that Messiah came? There has never been so much suffering. There has never been so much torture. There has never been so much violence. 
there has never been so much inhumanity in all of human history as there has been in the last 2,000 years and all in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind. That is the Messiah. The Christians answered and said, oh no, those people who did it are not true Christians. There are people who call themselves Christians, but they're not real Christians. My answer to that is to go back to the New Testament. I quote them a passage in Matthew 15. By their fruit shall they be known. A good tree does not bring forth bad fruit, and a bad tree does not bring forth good fruit. I don't care whether these people were true Christians or were not true Christians, the fact remains that all this inhumanity has been caused by the New Testament, by the Christians falling, or those who claim to be Christians, is based, these are the direct fruits of those teachings. As I said earlier, there is today not a single Christian theologian, Catholic or Protestant or whatever have you, that does not admit that the Holocaust in our own day, regardless what the Nazis claimed in terms of religious affiliation, the Holocaust in our day is a direct result, not indirect, direct result, an inevitable result of Christian history of 2,000 years. So much for the terms of reputation, for the polemics. I could go on and on and on with all the other passages, etc., etc. Every one of them comes up with the same answer. But ladies and gentlemen, my purpose here tonight, in spite of what it may have sounded here before, now you know why I gave this auditor's or listener's discretion advice, is not to attack Christianity. No, I have no quarrel with Christianity. No, no, I'm not being facetious, not at all. Not at all being facetious. To me, Christianity is a lie. Outright falsehood. Sheer nonsense. But that's to me. The same as the Christian would say that Judaism, the way I live it, is to him a lie and outright falsehood. You cannot be a true Christian and accept the validity of another religion. Nor can you belong to any religion and accept the validity of another religion. That's an absurdity. It's impossible. But we can respect one another nonetheless. Just because that is a lie, to me, I did not say it is a lie, period. It is a lie to me, and it is a lie to every Jew on earth. To the Christian, to the Gentile, for all I know, there is something in it. The same as all these other religions. God has many children. And you don't demand the same thing from all your children. Penicillin has healed and cured and saved millions of lives. But penicillin is also responsible for the death of thousands upon thousands of people. If you're allergic to penicillin, it's fatal. When a Christian would live the life of a Jew, the life of the Torah, he would be living a lie. He is spitting in God's face. Because the life of the Torah has no relationship, no bearing upon the Gentile. None whatsoever. He is taking a medication that has been prescribed for me, the Jew, and every other Jew. For the Christian, that is fatal. By the same token, the Jew that would live the life of the Christian is also swallowing poison, outright poison. It's living a lie. I've often said in various lectures, and these lectures are not held just for Jewish audiences. I've given the same lecture with the same content, and much worse. Tonight we have to be short, we started late. And I'm all, I've only scratched the introduction. In front of Christian audiences, and I have no problem with it, because they understand exactly what I'm saying. Whatever I have said so far could be said by any Christian any Muslim, any Buddhist, or any Hindu, just change the wording. Just change the terms. But the content is exactly the same. It once happened at McGill University that I gave this lecture, and there were a whole bunch of priests and ministers in the audience. And they heard me say, well, I want Christians to be good Christians. Do your own thing. But Jews must do their own thing. It must be true Jews. In the question and answer period, a priest raises his hand, says, Rabbi, 
I understand everything you said in your lecture, and philosophically, theologically, there is not a hole to be shot through. You are absolutely 100% correct. However, when you tell me to be a true Christian, and a good Christian, and my book tells me, go out into the hedges and compel them to enter, go and evangelize the whole world, and to the Jew first, you want me to be a good Christian? You leave me no other choice but to go missionize Jews. And my answer shocked him. I said to him, I have no problem with you going out missionizing. I have no problem with Christians going out evangelizing. I have no problem, and I even challenge the Christians, by all means, go and try and convert every single Jew you can find on earth. Just one thing. Make sure you convert him. What means convert him? Conversion does not mean that you sprinkle some holy water on him. There's an anecdote told of a Jew in Poland who couldn't make a living. And he hears that the priest offers money to whoever converts. Fine, so he moves from one village to the next and he converts from one, from one parish to the next. But in one parish the priest was not stupid. He says, before I pay you the price and all that, you have to settle here for a little while and I want to observe you. And he taught him all the laws, whatever he was supposed to follow, what he's allowed to do, what he's not allowed to do. And that was in the good old days when there was no meat on Fridays. So he warned him, remember, no meat on Fridays. Sure, everything, no problem. Converted him, paid him his fee, and he moved there in that village for a while. One Friday night, the priest uh, goes on an inspection tour, a secret inspection tour. He looks through the window of the Jew's home, and Friday night, you know what a Jew does, Shabbos. Friday night, without chicken soup, without the filter fish, without the chicken and all that, kugel, kishka, how can you survive? It's impossible. And the Jew sits at his table eating. The priest runs in, I told you no meat on Friday! Meat? Meat? What are you all talking about? What do you mean? There's chicken lying here on the table. Chicken? Where? What chicken? Chicken? Schmicken? What are you talking about? He says, there's a chicken! He says, that's not a chicken, that's a fish. Since when do fish have wings? Since when do fish have legs? Father, I'm telling you, this is a fish. You think I'm crazy? He says, I'll explain to you, Father, he says. Remember when I came to you last week, and I told you I want to convert? You took me to the church, you took some holy water, you sprinkled it on me, and you said, now you're no longer a Jew, now you're a Christian. Tonight, before I sat down to eat, I took some holy water, I sprinkled it on the chicken, and I said, now you're no longer a chicken, now you're a fish. <laughs> Every single case in history, and I state that without qualification, of a Jew joining Christian or Christian group, Christian doctrines, has never ever been a case of conversion. In all of history, there has never yet been a Jew to convert to Christianity. And I go a step further, and I make a prophecy. You know now who Emmanuel is. <laughs> there never will be. All they have, the most they have, you're no longer a chicken, you're a fish. What do I mean by that? What does conversion mean, I told the priest? Conversion means conviction. Religion is, as I started off tonight, truth. You don't join a religion to keep your mother-in-law happy. You don't join a religion for whatever other outside reason that may come in. Religion is not changing a dress the way they do it in Hollywood. Today I marry a Jew, I become Jewish. Then tomorrow, tomorrow she's divorced. Next day I marry a Buddhist, I become a Buddhist. That's not religion. That's a farce. Religion you can only join if you really, sincerely, deep in your heart and soul and mind, know and are convinced this is the truth. Absolute truth. The one and only truth as far as I'm concerned. It may not be the truth for somebody else, but for me, this is it. And there is no other way. If you don't have that feeling, if you don't have that intellectual conviction, not feeling just alone, but intellectual conviction, by examining, by analyzing, by studying, and coming up with an answer, you are not talking about conversion. 
You're talking about a farce, sprinkling holy water, that's all. So I told him, by all means, go ahead and convert every single Jew in the world. But convert him. Which means you cannot convert a single individual unless that individual first knows who he is and what he is and where he comes from. Once a Jew knows everything about Judaism, that there is to know about it, and he has found fault with Judaism, he can show that there's something wrong with Judaism, this makes no sense, this is ridiculous, this is a contradiction, this is absurd. And now that he has rejected Judaism, he starts looking for something else, and he comes up with the other thing, and he checks that, and analyzes that, and investigates that from beginning to end, and he sees, oh no, here there are no contradictions. All the problems I have with this book do not exist in this book. If you can ever show me a case like that, by all means, you have converted him. Who are the people who joined the Jews for J? Who are the people who joined the Hebrew Christians? Who are the ones who have been converted throughout history? Either opportunists, as happened in the 19th century uh, in Germany, because the professions were closed off for them, unless you were a Christian. And the same has happened in medieval Spain. So they converted for convenience sake. Hey, now I can get a professorship. Now I can become a doctor. Now I can become a this, now I can become a that. Never out of conviction. Who are those who may even be in the audience tonight? I guarantee you, without knowing who, what, where, and when. Not one, not one that can stand up and show that he knows what Judaism is about. Not one that can show that Christianity has any one single question to answer that Judaism does not have. Absolutely impossible. And therefore I state without hesitation, willing to be contradicted, that it has never yet happened in all of history, it's logically impossible to happen in all of history, that a Jew has ever converted to Christianity or another religion, or that a Jew ever will do so. Conversion has never taken place. Change? Yes. Joint? Yes. And that was why I answered him. And he had no response to that. He saw the point. So much for that. There is, however, one thing more. Time is getting on. And that is, it's all fine and good for me to stand here and show the fallacy of other religions and show the, uh, the immorality of conversion, the immorality of evangelizing, where they prey on the ignorant, they never come to me. Once, after a lecture like this, they challenged me. Are you willing for a debate? I said, yes, by all means, any time. But I'm not willing to waste my time. So the only way I will engage in a debate with you, I said, is under the following conditions. Listen careful. The debate will be on television. I will provide the television time. And the debate will be in front of a jury who will judge the arguments so we're not going to have a shouting match. I say it means this, and you say, no, it doesn't mean that. No, it doesn't mean that. No, it doesn't mean that. That's what you always have. We'll have a jury. Let the jury decide. Who will that jury be? I tell them, you decide. You, the Christians, you can pick the jury. They can even be members of your church. They can be, be believing or reborn or whatever have you. The works, I couldn't care less. There's only one qualification that I demand, that they be professionals. That they be professional judges or lawyers or scientists of that caliber. The rest, what their religious affiliation is and all that, I couldn't care one hoot. You choose them, you pick them. And I promise you before the debate, I guarantee you before the debate, that there is not a single claim, not a single interpretation, not a single argument that you can come up with that your jury is going to agree that you have proven a point. And if you will get them to agree on television, because then the jury, of course, has to watch its step, their professional credentials are now on the line, then I withdraw and I'll apologize in public and I'll send all my students to go to you, to go and learn from you. First they gathered, the said first debate, oh, they gathered it with both hands. The moment I gave this, it took them about a week to catch on. Then they started, I have this in writing. I have this in writing from the highest officials in the, what they used to call themselves in the 70s, the Hebrew Christian Alliance of America. 
Then they wrote me back a letter. What are you going to call proof? What are you going to call evidence? Even in science, there are problems determining what is called proof and what is called this. And, and also started backing the way out. I told them, look here, let your own people decide what is proof. Not my people. Not some outsiders from out there. Believing reborn Christians, your own people, your own ministers. But they will have to do so and show the evidence and make their proclamation and their pronouncements on television in front of an audience. Bottom of the line, they backed out. And this has happened every time they challenge me. I make them the same thing. Once you tell them that, they back out. When it comes even on a limited basis, after a while, they, today they don't even want to talk to me anymore. They arranged somebody in California wants to arrange a whole debate in a college of their own where they have quite a few Jewish students. And for that reason, they wanted them to be exposed to the other side. So they asked them, are you willing to have a debate with rabbis in your own college, in your own premises? I said, sure, oh, by all means. I've been looking and yearning and thirsting and hungering for that. Okay, we'll to set up a date. They asked him, who are you going to pick? They asked, it was Chabad House there in Los Angeles. They said, oh, we haven't decided yet. Oh, we'll find somebody, don't worry. And so who did they pick? And they already set up their list of their professors of that Bible college. And the Chabad, as I told them, I warned them beforehand, don't tell them until the last day. Uh, because till, till, till if it's before, I guarantee you they will back out. Comes to the last day, they figured last day, they figured eight, they will be too embarrassed to back out. The last day, they said, okay, you have, you have got somebody, you have to tell our students who and what. Yes, you're bringing up a shachat from Tonda. Forget it, he has no respect for us. He speaks condescendingly, he's condemning, he's, he's critical, this that. We don't want to talk to him. Fine, I certainly don't want to talk to them. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is all fine and good, and in some ways may even have sounded entertaining, though I do not find it entertaining, and I refuse in general to speak on this topic when it's just for entertainment. Unless it really serves a purpose, I don't want to talk about this, everything I've said so far. And we are forgetting one other side of the coin. To criticize the missionaries is the easiest thing to do. To me, missionaries, evangelists, are vermin, dirt. The lowest of the lowest of the lowest. And I'll make a statement that will probably shock you out of your feet, out of your shoes. I prefer the Nazis with the gas chambers, with the Holocaust repeated, rather than the missionaries. Because all the Nazis could take from us is our bodies, our lives. They could not touch our souls. The missionaries are after killing the Jewish soul. And that to us is the worst, the worst tragedy. I regard them as infinitely worse than the worst of the Nazis. Outright murderers of the lowest kind. However, on the other side, by condemning them, we have not solved any problems. We have not answered any questions. The other side of the coin is, who are their victims? Their victims are essentially our young boys and girls and not the way we used to think those who are strung out on drugs, those with terrible emotional problems, lying in the gutter, so they picked up this human refuse, let them have them. That's an attitude that is very often taken in the Jewish community. Another attitude that is taken in the Jewish community, how many are involved? If you have a community of 100,000, do you have 100 involved, 200, 500 even? Not even 1%. What are you making such a big tumble about? They play the numbers game. The truth, of course, is that those people who get involved are not the refuse of Judaism. More often than not, they are the best and the finest that we have. They are precisely the young people who are spiritually attuned spiritually searching, spiritually starved, looking for answers, looking for meaning, and neglected by our community. And whether it is 5,000 or it is one, it makes no difference. You want to know the value of one Jew? Go ask the missionary. The missionaries have a budget running literally in hundreds of millions of dollars. By their own estimates, 
It costs them approximately three to four hundred thousand dollars, US dollars, plus uncounted hours of work. Days and weeks and months to get one Jew. And my response to that is, they are getting them dirt cheap. If we were to spend just 5%, 1% of the financial resources, of the emotional resources, of the time that they are willing to spend on one Jew, we would have no problem. Not that we save one, we would be literally saving thousands. But then we have the numbers game. How many are involved? Oh, we have so many other problems. We have so many other commitments. We have so many other obligations. It's all fine and good to stand and condemn the missionary, but the missionary gets them by default. The missionary is very often the first one that provides for them a shoulder to lean on, an ear that listens to them, to show them some sympathy that is willing to talk to them. I had an interesting story some 20 years ago. I was asked to, to deal with a case in Denver, Colorado. And I decided since I'm in Denver, Colorado in a few days, I already hop over to California. We had some family. I've never been that far west in those days. Made all the arrangements, everything. I figured I would need about two, three days in, in Denver. And then this would be uh, travel on Sunday from Toronto, be there Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, go to California. Since I would be there till, till after the weekend, I told Chabad House there, okay, I'll be coming there. So if you want to use me, fine. And they arranged the Shabbaton. About two days before I leave Toronto, I get a phone call from Chabad House in San Diego. Oh, we hear you're coming to California. Yes. We need you. We have lots of problems. There was cults, lots of problems. There was kids getting involved. They're very active and so forth. Could you please come out? I said, I'm sorry, I have no time. I'm going to this and that. Then I have two days in California. At the weekend, I already promised to Chabad House in LA. And Sunday, I have to go back to Toronto. Now, I don't know if you people have ever been in contact with Chabad directors and Chabad workers. In, they have selective hearing. They only hear what they want to hear, and the word no, when you tell it to them, it, it, it doesn't register. <laughs> they have their own agenda. He kept me on the phone literally for 45 minutes. I give him every argument in the center. There's no way I can do it. And he keeps farting. Then he sees it's a hopeless case, so he takes a new tack. He says, where are you going from the airport? I said, oh, uh, I'm going to Long Beach. I have a sister there. Long Beach, California? Oh! And you're coming there when is the night? You know what? We'll pick you up from Long Beach shortly after you arrive. We'll take you to San Diego. It's 20 minutes drive. And then we'll uh, give the lecture and we take you back so you have lost no time. Well, that I could no longer say no to. I mean, all they're asking is just a couple of hours. It's not a special trip. Okay, I gave in. I surrendered. The case in Denver, Colorado was a failure, at least at the time. What happened thereafter, I don't know yet. Um, I go to, to, to California. I get to Long Beach, tired, exhausted, get there about 5.30, 6 o'clock, and relax, just hi, hello. Five minutes later, a car in front of the door. Came to pick you up to take you to San Diego. Already? The lecture isn't called till 8, 8.30. Yeah, okay, so I figured maybe they give me supper there, let me relax there. Okay, fine, good. I hop in the car, the car goes 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour. San Diego is two and a half hours from Long Beach. <laughs> if you go full speed on the freeway. I was furious. I mean, even chutzpah and this sounded a bit like Paul, heavenly deception. I came there, it was about 8.30 already by the time I arrived there. The Chabad rabbi stands on the steps of the Chabad house, like this. You're late. People are waiting for you. Oh. Husband, not even a hello. He has tricked me and lied and cheated to me and all that. And what is the hello? You're late. He still has a complaint. I'm starving. I haven't eaten all day. It's like San Diego. I didn't never heard about San Diego before I went there. And I decided after I leave here, San Diego will not exist on my map <laughs> anymore either. I come into the Chabad house. I figured maybe there's a big audience, five, six, seven hundred people, 25 people. And of those 25 people, 23 at least, were associated with Chabad House. The other two I don't know. 
For that you have to drag me out to come and preach to the converted? To waste my time? I didn't even want to argue with him. I didn't want to say I decided. You see how long the spiel takes tonight? I'm going to give him a 15 minute thing and goodbye and erased from my memory. I start speaking, 15 minutes, wind it up. If they have complaints, let them complain. What do I care? Uh, just as a minute before I finished, a whole group walks in with guitars and something else. And the Chabad rabbi comes behind me and says, Says, and those, and those, you say the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. <laughs> Who are they? Obviously, it was the opposition, the loyal opposition. A whole group from Campus Crusade for Christ, active on campus of the University of San Diego. Well, at least now I had somebody to talk to. <laughs> Before, it was just a waste of time. So then I went into the whole thing. I mean, and there I felt the responsibility. And when it came to questions and answers, one of, the kids, uh, one of their kids kept asking lots of questions, challenging, questioning, this and that. And I answered him everything he said. And then we finished. It's about 11.30. And the old pair went out and came over and said goodbye. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting lecture. And when he passed by, I stopped him and said, Just, are you Jewish? He said, yes. I said, oh, hold it, hold it, hold it, I said. Um, if you're Jewish, you asked here lots of questions. First of all, how did you get involved here? Listen to his story. How you got involved, he tells me, very simple. His mother is a graduate of Auschwitz. Came as a young woman to California, got married there, and they joined the Reform Temple. He said since his early youth, he was very tuned into religion. And he always used to bother his rabbi with questions about religion, about God, Torah, this and that. He used to ask him, does God exist? And the rabbi kept debating, what is God? God is love. God is the universal principle. God is the universal soul. Is, that, is the Torah divine? Well, you know, it's inspired. There's an ongoing divine revelation, ongoing inspiration, etc. The whole works. He says, after a while, I came to the conclusion, in my temple, there were at most two people that really believed in God, my mother and myself. And the rabbi, at best, was an agnostic, if not an atheist. But still, maybe that's the way Judaism works. Who knows? Maybe it's an optional thing. And that's how he went through the whole thing till he went to university. And one day, passing on the campus of university, where the campus crusade had a table, he was approached by one, suddenly screaming out, Hey, you there! You think you'll go to heaven? Imagine somebody asking a question like that. I mean, I as a kid, teenager, how did I get my kicks? We had no television. We had, I think, got to the movies and things like that. We, I got my kicks by going to, when I was in Yeshiva, go to Times Square and hassle these street corner preachers, uh, giving them uh, with all these passages. That's how I got my kicks. Um, <laughs> so when I get questions like that, if I hear people coming out with these uh, insane uh, things, I think, oh, if I have time, I take the mickey out of them like this. Oh, somebody get them knocking on your door. So uh, I invite them in with a big smile. Yes, by all means, come in, and this and that. Uh, usually five or ten minutes, they walk out backwards, be gone, Satan, be gone, Satan, <laughs> and so forth. And I treat them very nicely. I just question them, that's all. So he said, when he heard that question, he had the same reaction that I get. Hey, we are dealing here with a bunch of nutcases. He can have a good time with them. So he started uh, questioning them. What do you mean, heaven, this and that? He's trying to take the mickey out of them. And he says, something happened. He says, they asked foolish questions, they made stupid statements, I challenged them, but whatever question I asked them, they were not ashamed to stand up for what they believed in. They were not embarrassed to state what they believed in, they said it forthright, and that impressed me. For the first time in my life, I came across a person that was willing to state, speak openly, frankly, no beating around the bush, like his rabbi did. And one thing led to another, he became involved, and he wound up to be the main recruiter on campus. And he had really a charisma about him. That's what drew my attention about him. There was something about him, real charisma. And so I could understand that he was successful. So I asked him, look here, you have been here now tonight, you heard what I said, you asked lots of questions, frank, open, direct, I answered you. What do you say now? He says, yeah, you gave me lots of food to think about. Ah, I said, hold it. This is not food to think about. We are dealing here about religion, we are dealing here about truth, we are dealing here about reality. This is not something that you play games. Yeah, I'll shelf it till tomorrow. Either it is true or it is false, there is no in between. 
Yeah, 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 he goes on. To make a long story short, I asked him, I said, I want to, I, I ask you to, for just one thing. Go home, take the Bible, don't take any rabbi, and don't take any of those people. Just take the Bible, open it to Genesis 1-1, and start reading in sequence. Don't start turning pages from Genesis 3, and then to Genesis 49, and then to Exodus 12, and then to Leviticus 16, and then to Deuteronomy 18, and then Isaiah 7, and Isaiah 53, and Daniel 7, and Daniel 9, and Ezekiel 31, and all these whole host of passages they keep throwing at you. Read in sequence from Genesis 1, 1, for as long as it takes you, don't ever ask anybody for interpretation, no Jew, no Gentile. And then as you come across all these passages, ask yourself what these passages mean. If at the end of going through the Bible that way, you still come up with the, way, the approach that you have now, I have no problems with you. But I dare you to do that. It took me till 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, I didn't get back to Long Beach till 6 agreed to do it. Less than a week later, I get a phone call from the rabbi of the Chabad house in San Diego. He has dropped the whole campus crusade. He did what I told him to do. He dropped the whole thing. He went to yeshiva later on, and he came back, and he was instrumental in getting out literally dozens of Jewish kids. Because he was in there. He knew what it was. He knew what their arguments were. He knew their approach. And he now also saw the other side. And here we have a typical example of what is going on. That here he found somebody who was sincere. One thing we have to give to missionaries. They're hypocrites, they're cheats, they're vermin, they're the lowest of the lowest low lives. But one thing, they're sincere in what they're doing. And they're willing to, uh, to take abuse. They love abuse, because that means chalking up more extra bounty points for upstairs but they stand for what they believe in. And we Jews, unfortunately, don't. We are weak in that regard. Not only are we weak, we neglect. When there's a crisis, we jump, we scream, Oi, wait, what is happening here? But if there's no crisis, everything is honky doy and it's not, no problem, it's not in the family, it's only my neighbor's family. How many kids are involved? How many of them were on drugs? How many were lying in the gutter, etc., etc. So initially, I don't even blame the missionary. The missionary is simply picking up that which we have left for them to be picked up. And that is where we have to worry about. We have the concern to see, to prevent that. When I give lectures like these, even though I have had it happen, that from the lecture alone people came out of these groups, I don't expect that. I see my lecture more as preventative medicine. Let people at least know what the score is. So that if anybody is ever tempted, has ever been accosted by any of those low lives, let him know who and what he's dealing with. When it comes to taking them out, that's a different ballgame. It depends on what level they are involved. If they are involved emotionally, you can talk your head blue. If they are involved rationally, I can get them out in five minutes. If not five minutes, twenty minutes. If not twenty minutes, a day. If they are involved emotionally, forget it. I, have, I don't know how many cases of those involved in Jews for J and all these others that were brought to me and I talked to say at the end of the conversation, I see your point, you're 100% right. To admit the truth, some of them are honest. And then I ask, no, but? The answer is, but I feel it right in there. And that I cannot act against. That I cannot fight. I can fight on this level, where religion is at. Where it's emotion, there I can't fight it. And all it, is, it would take then is just patience, and perhaps in the course of time, we can wean them away from this. I compare people involved in cults, and Jews for J is an outright cult, as drug addicts. They are drug addicts. And the missionaries are drug peddlers. Literally drug peddlers. They are peddling a spiritual drug. And the proof you have, if you need any, I feel it right in there. And when I ask them, you tell me you feel it right in there? Go to the Moonies, Unification Church. Go to the Scientology. Go to the Divine Light. Go to any of these groups, the way, whatever it is. 
You can shoot down their arguments in no time. You don't need to be a great sophisticated professor of philosophy to do so. Nor do you have to know any theology. Simple, common, down-to-earth common sense. That's all you need. What do all of them say once you're finished with the arguments? I feel it right in there. Will the real one please stand up? He feels it, he feels it, he feels it. In a way, the simplest refutation to any missionary, take that as advice in case you're ever challenged. Whenever a Christian asks you, or whoever it is, asks you, why do you not want to join us? Why do you not want to believe what we believe in? You know what the simplest answer is? How does a Jew answer a question? It's a counter question. You tell me, if I talk to a Christian, why you are not a Muslim, give me the reason for that, and by giving me the reason for that, you have given yourself the reason why I am not a Christian. It's exactly the same reason, and I don't care what he's going to answer. And the same I can say to the Muslim, you tell me why you are not a Christian, and you will know why I'm not a Muslim. You tell me why you're not a Buddhist, and I'll tell you why I'm, I'm, not a, why, why you, I'm not a Christian. The whole concept of Jew for J is such a falsehood which denies all of Judaism and denies all of Christianity. People who claim to be Jews for J obviously don't know the first thing about the New Testament which declares quite explicitly, neither Greek nor Hebrew, neither free man nor bondsman, neither male nor female. There are no distinctions between Jewish Christians and Christian Christians, or Gentile Christians. It's all or nothing. And those Jews who are circumcised and got involved, let them listen to what Paul says. If you are circumcised, Christ shall avail you nothing. Finished, case closed. You're a lost case. You're a hopeless case. Why are you a hopeless case? Because Paul says also, if you're circumcised, you're bound to do all of the law. So forget about Christianity. The whole idea from a Christian point of view, to be a Jew for J is a denial of the New Testament. It's a denial of J himself. It's a denial even of the teachings of Paul. It's a total absurdity. It's a square circle. And for sure, it's a denial, it's a lie from the point of Judaism. Only I, the Jew, can tell you who is a Jew. You, the outsider, can't come and start giving me definitions who is a Jew. I doubt whether very much whether the Pope will allow me to lay down the criteria who is a proper and good Catholic. So neither can the Christian come and tell who is a Jew or the Jew for J. So those who claim to be Jews for J, those who claim to be some Messianic Jews, those who claim to be Hebrew Christians or whatever, they are denying Judaism and they are denying Christianity. They are just plain, simply denying liars. But they don't realize that they are liars. Why? Because they are involved on the emotional level. And so we come back. She says God exists. I know God exists. That is where religion is at. The definition of a cult is somebody who simply says, who simply closes his eyes, jumps, blindfolded, credulity doesn't know what he's talking about, purely emotional. Religion has to be like, I believe, Yitzhak of Adichia says, now I know. I examined it, I checked it, I investigated it, and I've come to the conclusion from here, not from there. That is what religion is all about, that is what truth is all about, that is what reason is all about, that is what morality is all about. We are not even talking here Jew versus Christianity. We are talking here basic decency, basic decency, basic truth, basic morality, basic ethics. Missionaries are anti-Semites. Missionaries are pinpointing an identifiable group within society and saying what Jay said, no man come at unto the Father except through me. You don't become a Christian? Down to the eternal barbecue. Hitler and all his henchmen, in so far that they accept him, go straight up to heaven to dance with all the angels. The six million Jews killed by the Christians because they died, thank God, in their faith, they are burning down there eternally in the barbecue. That is the Christian concept. That is the, the morality of the missionary. So when they talk about Jew for J, that makes as much sense as Pope Paul for Buddha. 
the Archbishop of Canterbury for Krishna. It's exactly the same absurdity. It means the same thing, because this is a contradiction in terms. When we, we are talking about here tonight, is not attacking this, is not attacking that. That is not the issue. The act of missionizing we attack because it is, in essence, absolutely indecent, offensive, obscene. And if you think that I can say such things on the here, just last year, I had a debate in Oxford, at Oxford University, with the Archbishop of Oxford on that very topic, the morality of missionizing. And the bottom line is he had no answer. It is offensive, it is obscene. Because you are pinpointing, you are telling, uh, this is what Hitler is all about. There are subhuman beings. Who are the subhumans? Those who do not accept Christianity, or for missionaries of other religions who don't accept that. That's exactly what it means. No man come unto the Father except for me. This means if you are not one of ours, you're not one of us, you are subhuman. You're an animal. You're a beast. You're a cockroach. I can step on you. I can get rid of you. This is what it is all about. Let the Christian lead a good, Christian, decent life and leave us Jews alone. Let us strive for that which God and truth, a God and religion and decency and morality is all about. And that is commitment to truth. That's the beginning, the Aleph, the first letter, the Mem, the middle letter, and the soft, the last letter. It's the beginning and end of all that mankind, of humanity, decency is all about. Thank you.